So my broadband went down this week several times, which is fine. Here, in self-isolation, it's not like it's my only lifeline to the outside world and also the sole source of my income in this trying time, as well as the only means of keeping me sane. <laughs> no. Anyway, normality restored, let's take a look at the personnel file of Officer SE19745T Montgomery Scott, also known as Scotty, one of, if not the most famous, of Starfleet engineers, who coined several in-universe stereotypes of the miracle worker engineer. While I enjoy Simon Pegg's portrayal of the character, this is going to be looking at his Prime Universe original, played by James Doohan. This file will contain memory beta materials, represented by this emblem in the relevant sections to flesh out his career and life around the main series of Star Trek and its films. Coincidentally, Scotty was born in Scotland in 2222 to Arlene and Montgomery Scott Sr., the oldest of three siblings. The town or city has had several locations cited, but generally raised around Edinburgh. He spent time in Aberdeen and Glasgow, where he enjoyed pub crawls. He also met a young Leonard McCoy as a child, and the two remained distant friends. He also befriended Glynis Campbell in 2229, and he tinkered with machines from a young age, but developed an interest in engineering after he realised he could not replicate his sister's artistic streak. In 2238, he disproved the Pereira theory and had his conclusions written up in several technical manuals. In 2239, he took part-time work in repairing freighters, even serving on the SS Deirdre for around a year. In 2241, he joined Starfleet Academy, where he studied most engineering courses available, as well as psychology, strangely. In 2242, he served as a cadet ensign on learning postings. He also undertook the command training program at his parents' behest in the latter years of the academy, and while he passed with adequate results, it was clear his interests lay in engineering. He would have graduated from Starfleet Academy in 2244 at the rank of Lieutenant Junior Grade. His first true assignment was to the San Francisco Fleet Yards, where he began to work on the construction of the new Constitution class of starships. During 2245, he was reassigned to the USS Gagarin for a time, then to the USS Kumari. He also served aboard a mining vessel and on the colony of Rigel 12. In 2253, he was reassigned to the USS Enterprise NCC-1701, currently under the command of Captain Christopher Pike as an assistant junior engineer. He served on this ship until 2264 and was eventually promoted to lieutenant during his tenure here. In 2364, he was awarded a promotion to lieutenant commander and guaranteed a chief engineer's positioning. He was then assigned to the USS Lovell NCC-470 among the Corps of Engineers to make repairs to the Neutral Zone Observation Post. In 2264, he received his posting, the Chief Engineer of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701. Here, his duties included maintenance of the transporter system, as well as his other duties as Chief Engineer. He was also appointed Second Officer due to his completion of the command program. During the famous five-year mission, he was killed in action by Nomad in 2267, but repaired shortly afterwards. He was also accused of murder, but acquitted, and in 2268, Kirk commends him for the 892 IV rescue operation. In 2270, he was awarded the Printeris Ribbon of Commendation. The Enterprise was taken in for its refit as part of the Constitution Refit Program of 2270, and Scotty was promoted to Commander and oversaw the Enterprise during its time in Space Dock. 2272 saw him take part in the Vija incident. In 2273, he was involved in a time travel incident where he was sent back to 1746 Scotland and became heavily involved in the Jacobite Rising. In 2274, he was involved in battles over Livery 5 and later returned to Earth to marry Glynis Campbell. It was most likely that during this time, he was involved in writing his numerous texts and regulations for Starship Engineering, as he was also involved heavily in Starfleet Academy. 
In 2285, during a cadet training cruise, he was acting as chief engineer on the USS Enterprise, now a training vessel, when the Genesis incident occurred and his nephew Peter Preston was killed in a battle with Khan Noonien Singh. In 2285, Scotty was promoted to captain and assigned to the USS Excelsior NX-2000 as temporary captain of engineering to oversee its prototype transwarp testing. Presumably, he would have been reassigned on its full commission. In early 2286, Glynis was killed in a shuttlecraft accident. In 2286, however, he sabotaged the USS Excelsior on the orders of Rear Admiral James Kirk, although he had little respect for the transport program and had always doubted its success. Of course, this culminated in a time travel incident to 1986 where he gave Plexicorp the formula for transparent aluminum. However, this may have in fact been a causality loop and always the case, as there was no timeline change when they returned to 2286. On the return to his time, he was pardoned of all charges due to Kirk's acceptance of blame and Scotty's own part in the rescue of Earth. In turn, he was assigned to be the chief engineer of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701A for its three-week shakedown cruise at the end of the year. In 2293, Captain Scott shot Colonel West during the attempted Kitima assassination, upholding the conference, and during these events he planned to retire from Starfleet. In 2293, he attended the launch of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701B as a guest of honour and was present for the run-in with the Nexus Ribbon that seemingly killed Captain Kirk. He continued with his retirement plans, and in 2294, Scotty boarded the USS Junolan, bound for the Norpin colony. However, it never arrived. In actuality, it had deviated to investigate a Dyson Sphere and was downed by its entry tractor array. In hopes of rescue, Scotty and engineer Matt Franklin placed themselves in mid-transport to preserve their patterns in suspended animation for 75 years. In the year 2369, the same Dyson Sphere was encountered by the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D and Captain Scott was rescued by the crew. He was granted the Goddard shuttlecraft by Captain Picard for personal use. Unsure as to where to head, he considered using time travel to attempt to save Kirk in 2370. On returning to Earth, he met up with fellow displaced Captain Morgan Bateson and Koloth of the Klingon Empire. In 2371, he re-enlisted in Starfleet after taking refresher courses and was stationed on Starbase 12. Here, he and Bateson worked on the construction of the USS Honorius, a Sovereign-class starship. However, after the destruction of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D, the Honorius was rechristened the Enterprise E. He then served aboard the USS Sovereign to test out some modifications for future application to the class. This ended in 2375. Admiral William Ross then appointed Captain Scott as head of the Starfleet Corps of Engineers, which he accepted, although delegated much of the paperwork, to the others so that he could continue to tinker. In 2377, he served on the USS Alliance briefly before 2382, where he served as captain of the Engineer Corps ship, the USS Challenger NCC-71099 for a time, then recommended Geordie LaForge for his replacement. LaForge may have taken command in 2385 after the Utopia Planitia attack, but the canon timeline is still unfolding, so I'll leave it there. According to books and the like, Scotty is still active within Starfleet, having even created a transwarp beaming theory by 2387, while taking increasingly managerial roles within the engineering divisions, much to his chagrin. In terms of hobbies, he focuses most of his time on engineering, theorising, problem solving and tinkering with machines. He genuinely loves the mechanical nature of his work and actively pursues knowledge and skills throughout all avenues of engineering to the extent that his hobbies and work blend. Of course, he does have his personal outlets. He is a fan of various alcohols over synthahol 
and a firm believer that these synthetic beverages are a poor substitute for the real thing, amassing his own collection of spirits, especially scotch. He is also immensely proud of his heritage, frequenting many locations across Scotland in his youth and seemingly deliberately learning the bagpipes. He expresses fascination at Scottish relics and takes advantage of Starfleet's dress uniform codes to don his kilt. His complete embracing of his culture entwines with his mechanical ability to such an extent that it has formed its own stereotype, or homage, to a Scottish engineer within the lore of Star Trek and in real life. In Star Trek Online there is even a class of starship made by the Corps of Engineers called the Miracle Worker in open appreciation of the man's illustrious career, a career that literally spans the centuries. He has routinely worked on the forefront of Starfleet ship design, from the Constitution to the Sovereign class, and it's no wonder that he was commandeered for the great experiment of Transwarp. As this project never succeeded in full, I like to think that some of his disdain for it came from his realisation that it wouldn't work. Just as in matters of science many would take Spock's word as truth, many an engineer wouldn't doubt Scotty, at least in his early years. He has confessed to LaForge, however, that he did intentionally pad his projections for repair work because he was aware of how pushy Starfleet captains could be in their demand for the impossible, giving him some wiggle room. This aided in his reputation as a miracle worker, but it's worth pointing out how disastrous this conduct could be if attempted by someone less experienced. In essence, he could afford to play up to his reputation, because it was actually well earned and not just all talk. Many of his repairs were likely done by fudging protocol in a pinch, bringing the times down, but he knew his ship and what it could take. He tended to personify his ship as much as any ship's captain, and having served most of his career circling back to the USS Enterprise, had a great investment and feeling of ownership to the vessel, often fretting over her stresses and status as you would a person. This could lead him to be overly cautious at times, but inwardly he knew the ship like the back of his hand, and would make it quite clear when a job was genuinely impossible from Scotty impossible. One theme that was present especially outside of the original series was that his services were in high demand and he would often serve briefly on other starbases, ships and other sectors away from the Enterprise for brief stints. However, such career-focused success did come at other costs. While not lacking for friendship, his self-imposed obsession with work often led him to be unable to sustain a relationship and there are numerous infatuations on his part throughout his career with his desire to remain in space often trumping opportunities to settle down. He disliked most actions that took him away from his engineering duties, and although was rated for command and the second officer of the Enterprise is said to have secretly dreaded these stints. It was the same when he was appointed to positions that required more administrative actions, and if we take his return to Starfleet as true, then it shows that he needed to occupy his time as well as return to the familiar in an uncertain era. More than anything, the man needed to feel useful and occupy his time with proactive efforts. Now, some Scotty-centric episodes have to include TNG's episode of Relics to see how he fares with being dislocated in time and suddenly losing that one thing that made him stand out, his relevant, expansive knowledge base. As for some more era-appropriate episodes, there's always by any other name, although not a Scotty-based episode, it's worth seeing for that one scene. And finally, I recommend Friday's Child for a good portrayal of Scotty in command. Thank you for looking at this personnel file on one of the most recognised Starfleet officers to serve, and tell me, what do you think of the extra canonical content included? Does it line up with what you'd expect from him, especially with his return to Starfleet at the age of 72? Or 147, depending on how you want to measure it. Thanks again for watching, I've been Rick and I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.